Welcome to a brief webinar, an informational webinar about the new COVID-19 supplemental funding for FQHCs. My name is John Michael Carter. I am the CEO of Chartspan, and I'm delighted today to have as my guest, Gary Lucas from the Association for Rural and Community Health Professional Coding, also known as ArchPro Coding. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. Gary, you're one of the leading FQHC consultants in the country. Certainly your company, ArchPro Coding, is. You're on the front lines with a lot of the FQHCs and the narratives we've been hearing are dire. Uh, people were afraid of layoffs in the papers today. There were significant stories about layoffs at uh, FQHCs and pra rural practices around the country. What are you hearing? Uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of uh, cases where, believe it or not, some of the billing and clinical staff are being pulled into offices to perform light duties, or they're even being asked to go out into the parking lot to register patients. But uh, the the lack of opportunity for patients to come in for their traditional chronic care visits is definitely down. The impact on revenue is significant, and uh, some of the highlights you're going to be bringing up are going to really uh, bring together at this important time some challenges I've been dealing with for the last 25 years in providing education to folks like this. So, so uh, the attention to detail in terms of how we're capturing medical records documentation and how we're coding that has never been more important than it is today. You know, with COVID-19, they're starting to draw some interesting parallels between uh, the patient's type of diabetes and their uh, whether they have uh, uh, obesity, et cetera, and how that ties in directly to the chances that patients are going to develop significant complications from COVID-19. And then you're seeing the opposite, that there are patients that have lupus. Uh, you hear uh, anecdotal uh, information about patients with lupus are not uh, you know, having the same challenges that everybody has. So it's vital that we recognize that the historical information we've been placing in the medical records for years is being scanned and pulled for very, very important public health information purposes, whereas our focus over time has been on revenue. And so if we're able to maintain a balance of care to take care of the influx of COVID patients, but find a way to take care of our chronic patients who don't want to be put at risk from coming into the office, that's where I see uh, your organization has done this a long time. Uh, but with staffing being squeezed, people being either sent home, laid off, or put into other areas, uh, I know that the opportunities that they have through chronic care management have probably never been more important because although we can easily tell a patient, sorry, we're going to have to do a telehealth visit, what are we doing in between those telehealth visits? Who's contacting the patient? Does a patient know they have somebody besides the office to reach out to to identify any changes that are occurring or what they're hearing from their other providers? So, Gary, I, I just wanted to bring touch on that telehealth and, and e-visits. That's been a yeah. big change for providers now being allowed to um, offset that decrease in E&M volume encounters that, that they're experiencing and trying to offset that with telehealth. How have FQHCs responded to that? Uh, you know, pretty much like uh, rural health clinics have, and that is that although the CARES Act, uh, the third phase, authorized Medicare to pay FQHCs for as distant site providers, as of today, and that's several weeks after the law was passed, we're still awaiting CMS guidance. And as of right now, the general advice is go ahead and do telehealth visits, but we do not know which form to bill on. We do not know what the exact payment amounts are gonna be. We're still waiting on the regulations to come from CMS. And so people are really being put in a very challenging position right now in that their Medicaid carriers are telling them they can do some things that Medicare is telling us, but Medicaid already has some of the rules in place for Medicare where your more challenged population might be. We're right now having to provide these services without a clear understanding of when we can begin to get paid for it whether or not we have new codes we're gonna use. And we are expected to get paid an average of what other healthcare facilities are getting paid for telehealth. But there's a large movement afoot where they're trying to actually get us our PPS rate if we're an FQHC. Uh, so we're literally in waiting mode, but patients are not in waiting mode. 
uh, the folks that I know that you have on staff working with uh, your facilities are not in waiting mode. And um, uh, it's a pretty routine, regular way for chronic care conditions to be treated with limited impact on staffing on site at their facilities while they're waiting to find out from Medicare how in the world to get paid for telehealth. And, and that's the head scratcher for me is CMS comes out and says to traditional practices, we're going to pay you the same for a telehealth visit as a traditional face-to-face -face e &M encounter, but then leaves FQHCs and RHCs kind of hanging. Like I said, it's a head scratcher. I, I don't understand how anybody benefits from that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big budget neutrality issue. Yeah, the, 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 to me, it's rather obvious that the FQHCs and, and rural health clinics, et cetera, should, should be the primary audience uh, for that type of care. However, uh, the old budget neutrality numbers were something like $20 million. If they spend $20 million more on a new uh, issue for Medicare payment, they've got to find that money from elsewhere. So there's a lot of, a lot of bean counting going on as well as head scratching. Uh, I, I acknowledge that. And one of the reasons we've always seen you guys as educational partners is because you, you quite the opposite. You don't have uh, the direct impact on staffing and you guys are able to help a practice maintain those active communications with patients so that uh, you don't have a kind of a drop in care during these tough times. A lot of pressure being applied now to CMS to get this resolved for FQHC. So we're all gonna watch here in the coming days uh, what happens. Uh, we mentioned the premise of this discussion was really the big $1.3 billion uh, health and human services supplemental uh, awards given to FQHCs, roughly about 13, 1400 around the country. Now that money can be used for COVID-19 for response, safety, and capacity, specifically around the detection, the prevention, the prevention rather, the diagnosis and the treatment of COVID-19. And as we extrapolate the different uses for those funds, we were thrilled to see that chronic care management can be a part of that, specifically around four areas that really check the boxes uh, for CCM. One is obvious. You need the additional personnel to help support the increased service demand, not just necessarily within your own walls, but remotely. Those patients who may need assistance, but can't or don't want and frankly, probably shouldn't be in, in your uh, practice waiting room. Uh, secondly, really focusing on um, providing telehealth to those patients in their homes. Third, providing community-wide education to those patients. And then fourth, something we do a significant amount of, which is the social determinants and helping those patients from home remotely with all of the social uh, determinant challenges that they're facing amidst COVID-19. As you think then from a reimbursement standpoint, the reimbursement for uh, the non-complex reimbursement code is uh, actually for complex and non-complex, it's blended, is $67 for an FQHC. If you put that in, in context for 100 enrolled patients, the annual recurring revenue of $67 per patient per month is $80,000 a year. And for 1,000 patients, that's $800,000. Uh, slightly more. So that's a significant amount of revenue. And in a moment where you're struggling with predictability and cash flow, Medicare pays within 10 to 14 days electronically, a CCM program becomes that predictable uh, uh, cash flow. And what's really interesting to me is because CMS is allowing FQHCs to use this money to stand up a chronic care management program to support patients with COVID-19, Think about the ROI on that. If I use that money for something that has no return on my investment, and it may be needed, that's one thing. But to, to say I'm going to use it and use it to subsidize my fees and costs associated uh, with running a CCM program, you get a significant return on that capital. And it's important and it helps patients as well as help maintain cash flow. So just a, a really important consideration we want people to think about. Some data points that I thought we'd share that we've seen over the last two weeks with uh, the CCM programs, and we manage more than 110 for uh, many of those being FQHEs and RHEs around the country, 28% increase in chronic care management enrollment. And not surprisingly, 76% of those calls involve COVID-19 subject matter. And we're not just doing the screening, but we're just dealing with all of the questions that come in from patients. And remember, these are your most at-risk vulnerable patients that are enrolled in the program. 
stunning statistic here on the bottom left, 70.1% of all patients that are eligible for the CCM program have enrolled over the last three weeks. That's a stunning conversion and practices should pay attention to that. That's patients talking. Patients want this program. Patients want remote access to your practice and the services and, and features that come with the CCM program. Up in the top right hand corner, 98.1% of every patient that we screen did not need an appointment. That means we're not clogging up patient waiting rooms with patients that don't need to be there at a moment that many of them are under stay at home orders. 45% increase in refills prescriptions, that's kind of anticipated. And one statistic I thought that was really interesting, we've seen a 12% increase in the amount of time we're spending on the phone with mm -hmm. patients. Predictably so, they're scared, they're fearful. The truth is we're not necessarily doing a lot of protocol uh, clinical-based screening, we're just talking about their concerns and their fears and the misinformation. Frankly, some of them are, are being solicited by scammers. Um, around COVID-19, we had one where they were trying to sell them in-home tests. There is no approved in-home test. These are the kinds of things we're dealing with and, and keeping the burden off the practices and helping with those patients. Finally, I just want to wrap up with the fact that Chartspan is proud to have stood up a COVID-19 rapid response CCM program for all FQHCs. What this means is that within 24 hours after we have access to your EHR, we can get your program up and running and get your patients enrolled. We've gotten rid of a lot of the baloney that often comes with, with trying to stand up a CCM program. So there's no minimum patient panel sizes, no long-term agreements. We want this to be simple, turnkey, and easy for you to decide upon and, and stand up the CCM program. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at info at chartspan.com or contact your regional vice president. Gary, thank you so much today. We appreciate all that you do. You've been a terrific partner and we appreciate the way you serve your FQHCs. I'm glad to help and uh, glad to recommend you guys as a legitimate add-on to, uh, to their practice and to you know, maintain continuity of care through available models that uh, don't require additional staffing, keep quality of care high and are reimbursable. So you're checking all those boxes. Thank you. We appreciate you. Take care.